Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman. Back here with some more Ottoman history. Ottoman War. We're doing the battles of Gurjani and Casanova. Casanova. I'm sorry, I butchered those names. I know I did. I apologize. <laughs> sorry. Uh, continue on the Ottoman uh, Wars. Uh, we just did a, a really awesome sea battle. Uh, it's called uh, Prevez Preveza. I'm sorry, I think that, I think that pretty, Preveza, I think that's what it was called. But anyways, uh, yeah, if you're new to this channel, definitely check it out. Definitely, I definitely should just start from this beginning of this playlist, and you won't be disappointed. Cool stuff with the Ottoman Wars. And definitely check out uh, some of the other content uh, with wars and whatnot, playlists and geography and cool stuff. Anyways, right? Anyways, uh, please hit that like and subscribe button. I really appreciate it. Helps out the channel a lot. And yeah, let's get to it. Doo -doo -doo. The next few episodes of our series on the Ottoman Wars will cover both land and naval battles, so we hope you are ready to dive into one of the most complicated periods in these conflicts. Yes! On the sea, the Ottomans were trying to consolidate their power after the victory at Previza, while on land, the conflicts around modern-day Hungary and Croatia continued towards their culmination at a number of sieges. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring for this video. We've been huge fans of Audible for a long time. Go to audible.com slash kingsandgenerals or text kingsand100. After the failed siege of Vienna in 1529, the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman I returned to his capital. Although his vassal John Sapoya managed to restore his positions in Hungary, the situation in the region was still very much in flux, and the Habsburg heir Ferdinand was not planning to stay idle. According to the Ottoman sources, his messengers visited Constantinople in 1530 and demanded Suleiman stop supporting John, which was refused. In response, Ferdinand moved his troops and attacked John, starting the so-called <laughs> Little War. The Habsburg advances were large. It's like it seems like it's a continuous like cycle here, like you know, Ferdinand attacks John, and then. You know, Solomon's like tax Ferdinand, and it's like a, it seems like a continuous cycle, you know? Like, Ferdinand, you're gonna have to like stand up and take the Sultan head on here soon and pay, kind of try and wipe him out, or else it's gonna be a continuing thing, it looks like. Starting the so called Little War. The Habsburg advances were largely successful, but weren't able to take the capital, Buddha. New ambassadors were sent to Constantinople by the end of 1530, but despite the fact that their tone was more conciliatory this time, no agreement was reached, and Suleiman started gearing up for a new campaign against the Habsburgs. According to the sources, the Sultan mobilized more than 100,000 troops for this yeah. offensive. The army left in April, and by July, many Habsburg fortresses in Hungary fell to the Ottomans. While well, at least they made it this time without like pouring rain and losing all their cannons and uh, you know losing a bunch of men to sickness. So, I mean, let me just take them. They might tell me in two seconds they did, but last time they were telling me as they, they were going. So, pretty confident that you know we, we, we might be making it there with a full army. While the lands in modern-day Slovakia, Slovenia, Austria, and Croatia were raided. Suleiman's forces outnumbered Ferdinand's, so the latter retreated towards Vienna, leaving an 800-strong garrison under the Croatian noble Nikola Juricic to defend the crucial fortress of Kurseg. At the same time, in order to avoid an open conflict against the Protestant leaders of the empire while he was still fighting the Ottomans, Ferdinand was forced to sign the Nuremberg Religious Peace. What? The sources are conflicted regarding the siege of Kurseg, but it seems that the Ottomans thought that it had a much bigger garrison since it defended a road to Vienna. So first the vizier, Ibrahim Pasha, and then the sultan surrounded it and used all the artillery and siege tactics they had in their repertoire. The garrison repelled 20 assaults and refused to surrender. What? The rains started early that year, and the imperial army was forming up in Regensburg to move into Hungary, so Suleiman decided to retreat to Constantinople. Huh. Wow. Emperor Charles... 
man, like they only had 800 men, but like, yeah, you're, you got a pretty fortified fort castle, whatnot, man, you can hold out for a pretty long time, but wow. Like I expected like him kind of blow through the air and be headed like to Ferdinand and having like a big showdown, but no, he's, he's got a, you know, certain rain. He's got to kind of like gather and gather himself, I guess. The fifth and his son Ferdinand knew that a new Ottoman invasion may happen in the future. So they sent a number of envoys to the Safavid Shah, Tamasp I, between 1529 and 1533, renewing the treaties previously signed with Tamasp's father, Ismail. In 1533, the Safavid Shah started inciting rebellions against Suleiman in the frontier regions, hmm. and that was enough to make the Ottoman Sultan sign the Treaty of Constantinople of 1533 with the Habsburgs. John Sapoya was recognized as the King of Hungary, while Ferdinand was to keep the western portion of the country and pay 30,000 guldens in yearly tribute to the Ottomans. According to a peculiar clause in the treaty, Emperor Charles promised to only use the title of Emperor in regards to the Ottoman Sultan. Huh. With that, Suleiman started his campaign against Tamasp. He sent letters to the Shabanids, and they attacked the Safavids in Central Asia, which pulled Tamasp's forces away from the front. This allowed the Ottomans to take the enemy capital Tabriz and then Baghdad with ease. But wow. further invasion was stopped by the Safavid Shah somewhere in the Zagros Mountains. The Ottomans lost tens of thousands during the battle there, and due to the weather conditions, Suleiman decided to abandon the campaign. Still, the Ottomans gained territories in the Western Caucasus, Iran, and Iraq. Yeah, I was I was going to say that they just had to give that land back, but no, apparently, apparently got they're, they're keeping control of that land. So wow, makes the like the empire even larger. Back in Europe, John and Ferdinand were constantly raiding and counterattacking. The apparent passivity of the Sultan emboldened Ferdinand. And in 1537, the Habsburgs attacked the Ottomans both on land and at sea. Oh. A 24,000 strong army under Johann Katzina moved to attack the Ottoman territories directly and take Osijek in modern day Croatia, which was crucial for the Ottoman supply lines in the region. Although the Ottoman garrison was just 3,000 strong, the fortress itself was well constructed and the lack of artillery in the Imperial Army, coupled with disease and, once again, the bad weather conditions, slowed the investment process down. A few assault attempts failed, and Katsina decided to wait the defenders out. This allowed the Ottoman governor of Belgrade, Mehmet Pasha, to gather a cavalry force of 8,000 and march to assist Osijek. The detail it's definitely different because I'm like not used to seeing the Ottomans right in this show on the defensive. They're usually the ones, you know, sieging, you know, and the ones that are on the offensive. This time they're on the defense. I was like, it's a double take. Am I looking at this right? But yeah, it is, and and that's kind of cool to get kind of kind of get to see their tactics and how they do, you know, when they're on the defensive. So this is pretty cool. So they got the cavalry come from behind. Got flank them. A cavalry force of eight thousand and march to assist Osijek. The details are unclear, but according to the sources, the Ottomans attacked the Habsburg army from multiple directions, and the latter suffered heavy casualties before they managed to form up and drive oh, wow. Mehmet Pasha's cavalry back. The fact that only horsemen attacked made Katsina think that the rest of the Ottoman army would soon arrive, so he decided... Hey, I was, I was impressed at the Habsburgs. Like, I expected Ottomans when they came flanked them. Like, it would just, like, make them all scatter and it kind of be a little bit of a slaughter there. Since they were coming from different angles. But no, the Habsburgs held them off. And were they saying they're expecting, they kind of think that more is, more is coming. So they're going to, like, retreat, you know, just in case. Made Katsina think that the rest of the Ottoman army would soon arrive so he decided to abandon the siege and retreat. During this retreat, which continued for a few days, the Ottoman light cavalry constantly harassed the imperial troops until both armies reached the area called Goyani. Wow. The Habsburg army finally saw that the Ottoman army was much smaller than expected and their commanders decided to counterattack. 
It seems that it was what the Ottomans were waiting for, as they feigned a retreat, luring the fastest Habsburg units into a trap where they were attacked by the garrison of Osijek wow. from both sides and by the cavalry itself from the front. With a portion of the Imperial army destroyed, Katsina fled the field and the rest of the Hab Holy crap, man, like, that was definitely well executed. Wasn't Didn't see that one coming. I kind of thought they, you know, the Hasburgs would kind of like lock themselves down here and then you'd have kind of a similar seed, not a seed, but you'd have the Ottomans on the offensive and, the, and them uh, Hasburgs playing defensive, but you know, Hasburgs were on the offensive, but they just, you know, wrong. Bad timing, man, because it was a trap. So, wow. Interesting stuff so far. Portion of the Imperial Army destroyed, Katsina fled the field, and the rest of the Habsburg units were shattered. The Ottomans lost just a few hundred troops in this battle, while the Habsburg losses were more than oh, wow. 20,000. At the same what? time, the United Christian Fleet had seized the coastal town of Castelnuovo off the coast of modern day Montenegro. Castelnuovo was Oh my, I'm sorry, I, I thought the Hasburg, like, I thought, okay, we're going to have, they're, they're going to retreat, they're going to have that, they're going to have a big battle here coming up, you know, I don't want, right here, like, I, I thought that these guys, you know, they were like, they could retreat after that, or they would be like, kind of even the odds out here, and then they have a good, you know, even battle here, but no, like, the battle's over right here, it's done, I mean, Hasburgs, you know, they got down, they got destroyed. So, I mean, Ottomans, man, kicking butt. It seems like the only really big way to stop the Ottomans is if, like, you have a castle, you know, like the siege, you know. If you have a castle and you're facing them, then, you know, you have a decent shot. But it seems like in the open field, like, you're outnumbered, or apparently this time you're just being outsmarted. So, cool. At the same time, the United Christian Fleet had seized the coastal town of Castelnuovo off the coast of modern-day Montenegro. Castelnuovo was not just a coastal outpost. At the height of their power, the Holy League had intended to use it as a staging point to launch a unilateral invasion deep into the Ottoman heartland. However, after the Battle of Previsa, the momentum had shifted. The Holy League dissolved, the Venetians had capitulated to the Ottomans for peace, and without Venetian ships, the former invasion plan was in shambles. In the winter following the victory at Previsa, Sultan Suleiman commanded Barbarossa to replenish his fleet and prepare it for an offensive campaign in the spring of 1539. Their plan was simple in execution. They would launch a two-pronged attack upon Castelnuovo. The red-bearded admiral would blockade the coastal fortress from the sea, while the governor of Ottoman Bosnia, a man named Uleman, would lead an assault from land, sandwiching their target from two sides. Nice. Oh, this is going to be good. Hungry? Order some subs to go with Firehouse Subs Rapid Rescue to Go. All right, here we go. Barbarossa embarked around 10,000 infantry regulars on his fleet of 200 ships, on top of a force of 4,000 elite janissaries. Meanwhile, the inland army numbered 30,000 strong. With a combined army pushing 50,000 men, the sheer might of the Ottomans would surely win the day. Sure. Meanwhile, it's not sound good. It would surely win the day. Uh, I just wait for a but, you know. They came out with too confident right there, so I'm, I'm definitely just, I don't know, not very confident that Ottomans are going to win this just because how they said that. <laughs> but we'll find out. Yeah, Ottomans, it seems like they, they're going to do it, but I don't know, I have my, not confident. <laughs> would surely win the day. Where are we ready? Meanwhile, the Habsburg garrison inside Castelnuovo was paltry compared to the colossal legions descending upon them. The defending force was a single tercio, a unit of Spanish pikemen and arquebusiers led by one Francisco de Samiento. The tercio itself was only 3,500 strong, supplemented by a few light cavalry and Greek soldiers. Nevertheless, they were resolved to put up a fight. 
Here we In go. the months leading to the Ottoman arrival, Sarmiento fortified his position, repairing walls and bastions and building new fortifications. He sent letters for aid across Habsburg domains to no avail. Andrea Doria, who had abandoned the fight at Previsa a year earlier, refused to risk his now smaller fleet to fight Barbarossa, and by the time the call for aid reached Spain, it was too late. On the 12th of June, a vanguard of 30 Ottoman galleys arrived at the Gulf of Kotor on Barbarossa's behest, blockading it. They disembarked an advance party of 1,000 soldiers into the hinterlands outside Castelnuovo to forage for food, water, and to capture locals for intel. The Spanish were soon made aware of their foe's landing, and Sarmiento dispatched a force of three companies, 900 infantrymen in total, to meet them. A ferocious sortie erupted, with the experienced Spanish pikemen and arquebusiers managing to drive the Ottomans back wow. onto their ships. Damn. Yet, in the afternoon, the Turks once more tried to sortie out onto land, only this time to be beaten back by a 600-strong force led by Sarmiento himself, with heavy casualties inflicted. Damn. Barbarossa arrived on the 18th of June with the bulk of the Ottoman fleet and immediately ordered his soldiers to disembark and establish a beachhead. The Ottoman governor arrived with his army a few days later from inland, and together they began digging a network of trenches around the fortress and setting up ramparts for the 44 heavy bombards that had been disembarked from the ships. Huh. This was a slow and laborious process which Sarmiento intended to fully exploit. Spanish soldiers sallied out of their fortress and launched several surprise raids to disrupt the Ottoman construction process. Smart, smart. The sorties cost the Ottomans dearly and provoked the Janissaries to retaliate by storming the walls of the fortress. However, they were caught unawares by a force of 800 Spaniards who devastated the Janissary ranks. Man, the Spaniards are kicking butt, man. They, they smart, man. They're playing this to a T. Uh, you know, taking... You gotta, you know, because you can't just sit back and let the the Ottomans just do what they want. I mean, you gotta do something about it, right? And they're they're harassing them. I mean, maybe you can get them to leave. I mean, you probably should make it a matter, but you know, you got at least you're taking some of their numbers out, and they'll maybe second guess themselves. And the next time they decide to, you know, go after you, we'll we'll see here. Barbarossa was furious, as the Janissary Corps was his most elite unit and the hardest to replace. Mm. He ordered his troops to remain cloistered defensively around the trenches until they were ready to launch a full assault. The defenders simply didn't have enough men to drive the massive Ottoman army from their beachhead entirely, so they retreated behind their walls and prepared for the siege to come. Ottoman fortifications were prepared by the 23rd of July, and Barbarossa was ready to bring the full might of his army to bear upon Castelnuovo. He sent an olive branch to Sarmiento, offering him peace and safe passage to Italy if he surrendered, even bribing each of his soldiers with 20 golden ducats if only they laid down their arms. The defenders refused, preferring to die in the service of Charles V. And so the bombardment of Castelnuovo began. For the entire day, the great bombards shelled the fortress proper, while the regular infantry stormed the walls. Losses were heavy for the Turks, for the Ottoman artillery caused much friendly fire, Damn. while the Spanish gunners inflicted devastation upon their foe. As darkness fell each night, the Ottoman forces would withdraw, giving the defenders time to shore up their battered defences, while a bishop by the name of Jeremias confessed the dying and kept morale high. Huh. Soon after the first wave of assaults, a Spanish contingent of 600 infantrymen sallied out of the city at dawn, launching a blitz upon an unaware Ottoman camp. Even the remaining Janissaries were routed by the sudden raid, tearing up their own camp in an attempt to flee. Wow. The Spaniards oh my came God. dangerously close to Barbarossa himself, who was forced to board a galley and head offshore to safety. Nevertheless, Still lacking in manpower, the raiders had to eventually retreat back to Castelnuovo before the bulk of the Ottoman army rallied and overwhelmed them. Is there like no like 
guys out there keeping an eye out, you know, like at the top of a hill to see if anyone decides to leave to do stuff like that. You think you'd have a lookout? Apparently not. Because uh, wow, I mean, I'm surprised you don't see this more often in sieges. You know, I guess you know the terrain's a lot different here than other sieges. You know, but they they're catching them by surprise a lot. It doesn't seem like the Ottomans are used to this. You know, they're just you know unprepared. Up until this point, the bulk of the defending Spaniards had held up in the upper citadel overlooking the town proper, but by August 4th, the Ottoman bombards had all but shelled it into rubble. That same day, the Turks launched a full-scale offensive on this vulnerable position. The defenders fought valiantly and managed to inflict yet more heavy casualties, but were eventually forced to retreat into the relatively more intact walls of the town, leaving Barbarossa to occupy the citadel. Fierce fighting continued on the following day. The defenders, battered and weary, still made the Ottomans pay dearly for every inch of ground taken. They defended the town valiantly, and the Turks were only able to capture a small section of the walls centered around a watchtower. Sarmiento dispatched a team of sappers to have this watchtower destroyed, but the fuse was lit prematurely, blowing up the sappers before they reached my, the tower. Oh my god, that's horrible. By August 6th, Ottoman artillery had rendered the town's walls moribund, and Sarmiento was forced to retreat deeper to a fortified castle in the town's southern district. Most of Castelnuovo's civilians were held up there, and the entrance had been barred. There remained no time to retreat within the fortification, for the Ottomans were encroaching quickly upon them. One of the townsfolk offered Sarmiento a rope to climb, but he refused, resolving to die alongside the rest of his men in a final last stand. Damn. Only 600 Spanish soldiers remained, and as the Turkish army fell upon them, they fought side by side until all were slain or captured. Wow. At the end of the day, only 200 defenders remained. Half were executed, while the rest were sold into slavery in Constantinople. Wow. On the Ottoman side, more than 10,000 men lay dead, though some sources claim that their casualties were as high as 37,000. The victory had Jeez. come at a great cost, and the Spaniards had put up a historically valiant fight in the name of their Habsburg overlord. Nevertheless, it was over. Castelnuovo was in Ottoman hands, and Habsburg influence in the Eastern Mediterranean had been snuffed out, at least for now. Damn. We are planning to cover every major battle and campaign in Ottoman history, so make sure you are subscribed. Damn, those defenders put up a fight, man. Props to them. They took it like 37,000. I mean, 10 to 37,000 of the Ottomans, man. Like, the, those walls, they just couldn't withstand. You know, they lasted long enough, and, man, they did as much damage as they possibly could. could. But they, they were never going to give up, no matter what the offer was. They were going down with the ship. And, you know, I, I, for, I, I thought for a moment that they were going to hold up, you know, and everything was going to be, you know, and then Ottomans were going to have to retreat, and then we might then they might have to come back. But you know, the Ottomans persisted. Like, they they won this place bad. And, uh, you know, they kept hammering home. And, yeah, they got the victory. So congrats to the Ottomans. But definitely congrats for to the defenders because, you know, they put up a hell of a fight, man. A lot of heart going out there. But anyways, guys, let me know your thoughts uh, below. And I'm looking forward to see what happens next. Are we going back to, uh, you know, are we going back? back to attack the Hasbro's I'm obviously I'm guessing so uh but anyways guys yes hit the like and subscribe button below let me know your thoughts again and catch you guys in future videos awesome exciting stuff they have a bunch of cool interesting battles here and crazy stuff going on love it good stuff anyways yeah, peace catch you guys in future videos I am out of here woohoo